Um, can, we... can, can Lydia start and then you can come? Okay, yeah. I think we should be on time. Yes, We're already yeah, quite late. Okay. okay, super, thank you. <laughs> okay. Are you ready? Ah, oh, super, okay. Hello, welcome back. Um, we have smaller audiences now because, um, actually, I'm gonna ask the workshop room to close the room, the door. Um, okay, we are now in our um, seminar breakout session uh, titled um, Conversations Between Arts and Heritage. Um, so Saturday today is the first time we're doing this. It's a bit of an experimental uh, format but um, we're excited to see how it works. Uh, the goal is to have more of an um, uh, engaged conversation with smaller groups. It's also a two-hour session, so uh, sorry for starting a bit late. Um, we're really excited about all the, all the speakers that we have here. So basically, we're gonna have two uh, speakers. This uh, seminar session, one, is um, entitled Constructs, and uh, it's focusing um, mostly on, I would say, aspects of curation. Um, and we have two lovely speakers. I'm gonna let them introduce themselves, or would you like me to say a couple words? Okay, um, Moody Madai Madaiba, no. Mudi Mahaya, uh, Yahaya, I'm sorry, um, is uh, an artist and curator from Nigeria who is actually an artist in residence at Zetkau, which is the space that we're in. Um, and he has some really interesting work. Uh, he's actually part of the visual art exhibition that was last night. So if you were here, you saw him speak a bit about his work. Um, Lydia Rossner is um, going to be speaking about um, her work, which involves more uh, conducting interviews with people as a part of artistic research process um, connected with biennales. And Moody will speak more about Documenta specifically. So um, yeah, so basically the format, just really quickly, is that each um, presenter will speak uh, give a presentation, and then hopefully be inspired and have questions for each other, and then it will turn into a group discussion so that we can use the two hours. Uh, if it runs short of the two hours, that's totally fine, and um, we'll see uh, how far we get. So uh, thank you. I'm gonna introduce uh, Lydia as the first presenter. Yeah, if everybody could actually come closer so we can have a, the dialogue part is a little bit more accessible. <laughs> Great, and um, for those watching the live stream, I just wanted to announce that we have uh, two other seminar sessions happening simultaneously right now, so please really come forward, everyone. <laughs> um, uh, two other seminar sessions happening. One is um, uh, with the theme music, which is um, with Hylam Kim from South Korea and Debbie Withers from from England, um, who are speaking about different um, relationships to uh, music, relationships to archiving, interp contemporary interpretation of tradition. Um, and then downstairs in our exhibition hall, we have um, the urbanization uh, seminar session with um, Professor Zaxenmeyer and members of Kunstrepublik who run um, the space as well, and um, yeah, they're speaking about aspects of different perspectives on urbanization and arts. So, now I'll introduce Lydia to present, um, and please move forward. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. Yeah. Hello, it's kind of lower. Maybe I should get high heels. Um, thank you. Didn't grow. Hi, thanks for uh, coming. Um, I just wanted to start by saying that my research is um, within the field of visual anthropology, and uh, my focus is in contemporary art, and mainly I've been doing it through interviews with artists, curators, and um, art critics, and theorists, and uh, I have been focusing on biennials as institutions, and what they're, how they're organized, how they function. Closer, okay and um, what they do for, for society and heritage um, in general. Um, so globally, right now there are about, there's not a, a consent on number, but between 150 and 200 art biennials. This is biennials for contemporary art because they're also architecture, design, and so forth. And um, the oldest one started in Venice in 1895, and probably most people know that one. 
Uh, it's based on national pavilions, which means each country has a representative building and they send the best artists uh, from their country to sort of represent their country. So it's, it's a, almost like a cultural embassy. Um, and it's very much a geopolitical issue because by the architecture of the pavilions that were built at the beginning, you can completely see the, the structure of power at the time, the political power. Uh, for example, Great Britain, the US, France, they have the biggest pavilions in the most prominent place. So, but um, to kind of a little bit define biennials, what um, I could say that they're large scale, um, international exhibitions, and uh, they, their aim is to showcase the latest thoughts, um, expressions, and artistic research um, in global art production. So, um, on a most basic level, the art biennials as institutions, some are just organizations, uh, the new ones, their role in society is to present culture. And, um, by presenting culture is not just showing artworks as art objects, but also creating a discursive platform where they organize um, conferences, symposium, talks, and just kind of more of a mediation um, about what's going on in the art world. And, and in a way, uh, through these debates and lectures, they kind of create a, um, a, a a different space in the urban city where they're at and uh, because usually they're in a public space. So um, I consider these exhibitions to be um, a medium, um, which is a tool to disseminate knowledge and artistic production and ideas. And so if you think of it that way, then the potential for uh, some kind of an impact or effect um, of these exhibitions is pretty great uh, because they can reach a mass audience and they can really communicate a lot of different ideas. So um, by functioning as a medium, the exhibition contextualizes and mediates art and uh, it's where the coalition between artwork and viewer is negotiated and dialogue is initiated, and that's where meaning is constructed. And this interconnectedness um, could be described as um, transcognition, uh, which is what uh, Sullivan, who is a, an artist and an art educator, wrote in his artistic thinking as transcognitive process. This trans transcognition is where, um, it's the process where the self and others are parallel and necessary agents of mind that inform each other through analysis and critique. So in that sense, the exhibition is that intersection where the curator, the artist, and the public uh, meet and construction of culture and knowledge exchange takes place. So but to go back to the beginning a little bit, um, when Venice started, it, was, it took about half a century for the next biennial to, to be established, and that happened in 1951, and it was in Sao Paulo in Brazil and it was also based at the beginning on this um, uh, national pavilion model. Um, then this was followed by Documenta in Casa. Most of you maybe have heard of Documenta. It's not a biennial, it takes place every five years. Um, and so this was in 55, then in 73, it was uh, the Biennale of Sydney, Australia, and then the Havana Biennial in Cuba in 1984. So the, f for the first, you know, for, for one century, there were almost uh, just a handful of biennials, and then it was in the 1990s that there was an explosion of all kinds of art biennials. And um, mainly this coincided with uh, global um, political changes, economic changes, changes in political system and, and uprising. Um, and on the other hand, I think a big reason for it was that there were just simply more um, institutions that were providing education in 
art practices, curating. So these people needed some kind of a platform to, um, to work. So um, the other thing that it's worth, worth mentioning uh, is that many of the biennials have started at a place of conflict where the city or the country had experienced some trauma and um, the biennial was a way to sort of revitalize the spirit of people. So for example, uh, Documenta in 1955, uh, it was after World War II and uh, it was a way to reintroduce German people to um, the movements in contemporary art and modernism at the time. Actually, it, it was very historically oriented, the very first one, and it kind of uh, showed art that was made since the beginning of the century, art that German people, because of uh, the war, was, were not able to, to see. Um, another example is the Gwangju Biennale in South Korea that started in 85, oh no, excuse me, 95. Um, and it was a form of commemoration of the tragic events that occurred there in 1980s. In May, there was a, um, a demonstration against the military regime at the time, and many, many uh, students who were not armed were just killed. So this is a very tragic event in, in South Korean history, and they basically established a biennale to commemorate this and to never, to keep it in the memory. They always have some kind of a reference to it. Um, and a more, more recent um, biennale that started was Prospect One in New Orleans, in, in um, uh, Louisiana, the United States. And that was about three years after Hurricane Katrina devastated the city. And uh, the curator that, uh, who initiated it was Dan Cameron, mm, who has had a uh, huge appreciation of the heritage of New Orleans, and he wanted to just bring people there and bring artists to respond to the situation and bring awareness. Um, also, by bringing the, the biennials bring a lot of tourism to the cities, and they also impact the economy that way. Another set of reasons for establishing a biennials uh, have been to demonstrate openness and progressive development, also to showcase cultural heritage. And such cases are, I'll just name a few, the Istanbul Biennial in Turkey, which started in 87, the Shanghai Biennale in China, which started in 96, and the Sharia Biennial in United Arab Emirates, which started in 1993. Um, and then there are a few biennials, such as the Dakar Biennale in Senegal, which is called Dak Art, it was established in uh, 1996. And also the, uh, the Havana Biennial, they were both established with the reason to uh, kind of create their own representation and to have an alternative to the Western Eurocentric art exhibitions at the time. Um, so what is different, how did biennials differ from, let's say, an art fair um, or museum exhibitions or galleries? Uh, mainly, I would say that they're um, organized in tempor temporary spaces. They don't have a set space. I mean, a lot of them now do, but uh, that's one reason. Also, they're considered to be non-commercial. So the artwork that you see there is not for sale. Uh, however, once an artist participates, their, their value on the, on the art market really uh, increases. Um, but typically, the, the artists receive a small fee, a small honorarium to participate. However, what is different is that the biennials have funds to pay to produce new works. And these new works usually can be pretty big and pretty expensive, which is uh, something that being in a museum setting or a gallery is not uh, possible always. Um, also, there's um, uh, uh, the discursive element, as I mentioned before, and uh, there's a, a big um, kind of element of performance. Performance, not only in the sense that they present performances, but also there's a performative aspect to curating a biennial. So that's the main uh, kind of difference. And then um, 
you know, if we think about art, we think about traditionally museums, which is where the spaces where art traditionally has been exhibited and made available to the public. Uh, however, museums are not as flexible to change their exhibition that often, also to find funding. It's, it's a big um, organization usually, and they're very slow. Um, the, so what is also different than a museum, let's say, who has a permanent curator working there is that the biennials have a new curator or a new curatorial team that has been selected by an international committee for each edition. So you have a completely new uh, idea on how to realize this completely new uh, set of approaches, artists, and so on. Um, so the, the curator, when, once they're selected, they can bring their own team, uh, associate curators, and uh, people that they enjoy working with and they can trust because that's a, a big issue. They don't have that much time. Uh, usually they have about 16 months to prepare a big exhibit, which means they have to uh, find a lot of artists, you know, uh, organize the production of the work, find venues, funding, etc. cetera. Um, so what is interesting to mention is I think that um, th there has been a lot of questions about how are the artists chosen to participate in the Biennale, and the answer is it's super subjective, you know, it's who the curator is, who they know. A lot of times they, uh, for practical reasons, want to invite artists that they have worked with already, and they know that they will produce work that will be high quality and on time. Um, but uh, speaking of museums, I want to expand a little bit on museums uh, to talk, for example, about the ethnological museums and um, ethnographic, sometimes they're called, uh, which is where we go to see items, objects that are kind of physical traces of heritage. And these objects have a huge representational value. They, they tell stories, they tell of cultures, they tell of people, and it's just this one object that it's in a glass cabinet and it's precious. <laughs> you know, it's there, it has the information, and um, it's really elevated. And so I was, um, I mean, of course, objects trigger memories and so on, and they carry, carry also memories. But I, I'm also thinking about how what happens to an art object, a contemporary art object, uh, when it's put in a museum? W what is the value of that object? Does it have the same kind of associations as, a, as an object that's supposed to represent heritage? And um, it's, uh, if you're in Berlin, it's a, it's a very good time right now. It's the eighth Berlin Biennale for contemporary art, and a big part of their exhibition is in the Ethnological Museum in Dahlem. And uh, it, you can kind of feel that, you can see it and experience this, because um, the contemporary exhibition spaces are right next to the permanent collection, which hasn't changed since the opening of the museum. So it's interesting to kind of walk through really old stuff, objects, little figures, vases, and then encounter contemporary art in the same setting. So if you're interested in this kind of um, connectedness, you can, you can experience it maybe. It's open until August, I think, yeah, at the beginning of August. Um, and I'll mention the Berlin Biennial a little bit later as well. So, but, so, so what do we do with these biennials? You know, who is supposed to study them? Are we supposed to study them? Do they, you know, how do we make sense of them? So this has been, for the last few years, kind of a topic for a group of people, and they've organized, um, kind of an archive, it's, it's called the Biennial Foundation, and uh, it's mainly people that have worked in biennials for uh, a long time. And they started compiling and archiving documents and papers that were written, articles about biennials to kind of organize this existing knowledge. Um, in 2010, they published the Biennial Reader, which is a collection of texts about biennials, and it's the, their attempt to create an anthology of the pre-existing knowledge. And they also will have a conference here in Berlin in July. If you're here and you're interested, um, you can attend it. It's, it's open to the public. It's going to be on the 13th of July. Um, so 
I think I can now present a few. Do you have any questions, by the way? So far, okay. Um, I, I will present a few uh, case studies just so that you can kind of make sense a little bit of, okay, this is what they are, but how does it actually work? And uh, since I talked about Prospect One in New Orleans, I can start with that. Um, as I said, this is the first large international biennial in, in the United States. Mm, there's the Whitney Biennale, but it's uh, mainly for US-based artists. And uh, the Prospect One took place in 2008 in New Orleans, and there were about 80 international artists, and there wasn't a one uh, venue, one building, but they were spread around the city, which was the idea of the curator that visitors can actually explore parts of town that are not the tourist locations. This is not what you know about New Orleans when you go there and see, but the areas that still have been, uh, uh, were at the time, I think maybe now still are struggling um, with the, after the devastation from Hurricane Katrina. So uh, there was not a thematic kind of framework. Artists were just supposed to go there, experience, see what's happening in the city, and make works based on that. So many of the artists, for example, Vangeshi Mutu and Mark Bradford, they made their works in the Lower Ninth Ward, which was the most devastated area. And it has been completely forgotten. I mean, a lot of the, mm, like the, the tourist destinations, like the French Quarter of New Orleans has been rebuilt and still was attracting tourists. But um, the kind of, the poor areas have been completely ignored. So by exhibiting works there, they forced uh, the audiences to go and actually see what's going on and perhaps in a way take action. Um, and one of the artists actually built a house for a lady who lost her home and somehow with her insurance, it, things didn't work out. So uh, her artwork was, she just met her there, heard her story. Uh, the artist is Vangeshi Mutu and her artwork is called Miss uh, Sarah's House. So during the Biennale, she just made a, a construction and made Christmas lights so that it's, it's, uh, it, it can be lit in the dark and uh, collected funds and organized the building of the home. So the home was built after, I think, a couple of years, it was finished. So it's, it's interesting to see that this kind of uh, intent from the curator had a real impact in the city. And there were other situations too. Um, since we're talking a lot about heritage here, and um, New Orleans is a very special place in terms of heritage. It's, it's very unique. I don't know if any of you have been there. Um, but so there was, there was a, a, a group of, our, well, two collaborators, uh, one from Thailand, one from Canada and um, it's called Navin's Party. Um, they had a very simple project. They kind of are looking up the name Navin. Is there somebody in New Orleans with the same name and we can do something collaborative with them? And somehow it was misspelled and they came up to this really uh, famous musician who passed away uh, during the evacuation. He was evacuated uh, because of Hurricane Katrina. And uh, he wasn't, they weren't able to then move him back to New Orleans and give him the proper jazz funeral, which is a big, a big thing there. I mean, this is a big part of their heritage, uh, that they have this jazz funeral and people walk and they play music. It's a big band and throughout the city, and it's a big procession. That's, that's something big. So the artists were actually able to do this. They did a, a jazz funeral for this, um, for this musician. Um, so these are kind of uh, examples of what is happening with these more open and flexible platforms for contemporary art. Um, another very interesting biennial is the Istanbul biennial uh, that started in, uh, when did it start, in 87? Um, what, what I was curious about is so a lot of biennials have titles and um, you know, when you title something, you kind of guide people to have already some, some idea about what you're expecting, what you should expect to see, um, or guiding you how to interpret what you're seeing. So I wanted to give you kind of a, as a historical thing, because the Istanbul Biennale has all, actually, all of the exhibitions had names. Some, some exhibitions don't have names, but 
I'll just give you starting from 87. So the first two, 87 and 89, were just titled Contemporary Art in Traditional Spaces. Because they were establishing the Biennale and they kind of were uh, obviously being very conservative. The next one was in 92, Production of Cultural Difference, followed by Orient with hyphen Asian, so orientation, the image of art in a paradoxical world. And this was the first one that actually had a curator before it was a committee, artistic committee from the city. Um, then it was fo followed by On Life, Beauty, Translations, and Other Difficulties. So going more into poetics, followed by the passion and the wave. Ego fugo, fugue from ego to the next emergence. Poetic justice. Uh, 2005 was simply Istanbul. And 2007 has a very long name. This is actually the one that I uh, did a research on. Not only possible, but also necessary. Optimism in the age of global war. Uh, this pioneer was uh, curated by Hu Hanru, uh, who is a Chinese-born uh, curator. And uh, in 2009, it was What Keeps Mankind Alive, followed by Untitled in 2011, and the most recent one in 2013, Mom, Am I Barbarian, um, was the title of it. So you can see there's a lot of um, um, a, a lot of um, thought put into creating these biennials and making them more of a uh, kind of an intellectual platform, it's not only to present art, but you know, having this kind of discursive platforms. Um, and so what I, I asked Hu Han Ru about his very long and cumbersome name, what, what does it mean to have to name a biennial? What does it do? Who is it for? Is it for the artist? Is it for the audience? And so um, he said that it was a way to contextualize artistic production and, um, and bring a starting point to generate a situation based on response to this kind of one title, one sentence. Um, and he, he believes, Hu Han Ru, that it's not about illustrating a theme, but it's providing a space, a time, a context for artistic production. Um, so, Hu Hanru's interest in Istanbul was obviously in, in, in its past, but also in the present. He was looking into the, the current urban culture and the political situation in Turkey, Turkey as something exemplary that can be a model that could be transported and applied in other countries. And uh, so he focused this um, the, it was the 10th Istanbul Biennial on revitalizing the debate on modernization and modernity and uh, to put forward activist proposals. Um, so for him, it wasn't so much about an exhibition, but about how um, to look at, at, at a life in a city which has such an incredible and complicated and contradictory history. Um, so I, I just want, will give you one example of an artist project from this biennial uh, because I find it very interesting how these kind of ideas travel and circulate and can be applied transculturally. And um, it's a, an architect and artist based in San Diego, California. His name is Teddy Cruz, and uh, he uh, his research focuses on the transborder issues between Tijuana, Mexico, and San Diego. Uh, specifically, um, people from Mexico go to the U.S. in search for work, and people from the U.S. go to Mexico for, um, for cheap labor, basically, and they establish, through this uh, NAFTA uh, trade agreement, a lot of maquiladoras or little factories were, were set up in Tijuana, specifically to produce things cheaper for the United States. And so what that did to, uh, Teddy Cruz was looking at what, what happened then in, in these, around these maquiladoras, what, where are the people, who, who works there and where do they live, what conditions. So of course he found shanty towns around, uh, people were living in really uh, makeshift 
homes and um, there's a rainy season every year and uh, so they were all collapsing so it was a constant struggle and he was looking into okay how can me as an architect and artist what are my responsibilities because I also consume these goods that are made in the maquiadoras it's not fair for these people to live in these conditions it doesn't take much to improve that their situation so he approached the, the factories and asked them can we make our design frames, our design support system, and we can adapt to make them from materials that you're already working with in your factories, and maybe even discarding. And we can provide structural support for the homes of the workers because they're there to stay, they're not going anywhere. So he, he did this, and then he also started looking into um, creating this uh, uh, living spaces for Mexican workers who were working as a very cheap labor in San Diego and were living in a very also bad uh, conditions. So what was interesting is that I saw this project in Istanbul and it's about San Diego and Tijuana and you know I was curious why you know it, it worked really well because every country probably has this kind of problems specifically Turkey so it was interesting to see how the curator you know, chose this project as to, you know, being in this kind of uh, thinking of how can things be models of social life, of, of different arrangements can be applied in other countries, in other situations. Um, so in a way, uh, Teddy Cruz's project received global exposure instead of just being in San Diego, Tijuana, and, and his ideas have been applied in many places by now which is great. So one more, I don't know if I'm running out of time, I'm not keeping track. <laughs> I can talk a lot about this stuff, but um, I think another interesting bayanio is the Shanghai uh, bayanio, which is in China. And that started in 90, 1996, and it was, um, actually it's on their website, they're saying that it, the Biennale aims to expand Shanghai's importance as the gateway to the West through the art sector. Additionally, it means to serve as an international platform for the self-portrayal of China and Shanghai. Uh, so th that's a really interesting biennale because they're dealing with a lot of censorship. Initially, the first few biennales were curated by Chinese um, or other Asian curators that were used to working within the censorship system. Um, when I went there in 2008, it was the seventh Shanghai Biennale, and the curators were both from Europe. Uh, one was Hank Slaha, and the other one, um, Julian Heinen. Um, and so they had a, a third co-curator who was uh, Chinese, and they had a lot of issues with trying to make an exhibition. Uh, the, already the theme was set to them by, um, for them by, uh, an artistic and educational committee, and it was called Translocal Motion. So they had to do something with it, and um, they decided to take the People's Square, which is kind of the main gathering area, it's, a, it's the very center of Shanghai, and to do some projects about this, to study the project as a public space, as an urban space, and its social implications. Um, but a lot of projects were not possible, they were censored. Uh, at the end, there were 110 artists uh, that presented uh, work, and the event was broadcast on Chinese television. It was this really huge event, uh, mass media event. So the curators proposed um, to do a three-part uh, exhibition. Uh, one was um, called Project, where artists were invited to reflect on the city anyway, on People's Square, and kind of do work that it's not so obvious, but a little bit more sublime, and um, to work within this censorship committee, because each project at the end had to be approved. They were going like 20 people with their folders, and they had to mark everything off. They were looking at all the artworks which was very strange for a lot of artists. Some of them actually had to sign a contract that they will change the project and so on. 
Um, so another one was Keynote, where there were just three artists presenting a body of work uh, focusing on issue of mobility related to urban development. And the next one was Context, where 33 artists examined the theme of the Biennale in a wider, uh, wider global context. Um, what is interesting about Shanghai is uh, that this was a very good project to, to examine People's Square because um, Shanghai by now is over 24 million. It's the biggest city in Asia, maybe in the world, I'm not sure. But it's composed of the 40% uh, of, comprised of 40% migrants. 40% of the population are, have migrated there for work. So, of course, they each bring their culture, their heritage, their, their uh, habits, and um, this is very much reflected in that people's square where they all gather at one point. Um, and a very interesting project um, on, based on this research on people's square was by a German artist, Hito Steyer. She is based here in Berlin. And interestingly, her mother, who is Japanese, was actually born in Shanghai during the war. So she initially went to look for the, the birthplace of her mom, but it wasn't there anymore, of course. And so she had to change the project, and um, she just started looking at the bootleg DVDs the, the, that were being sold at little tables. So what happened was initially she was looking at, okay, which films are being taken, stolen, and then she was looking at the images which were very interesting. And then what, uh, what became very interesting to her was the language, what was written on them. It was a very broken English, but it had some kind of a regularity and she also found a name for that language. You know how on the DVD's covers it says German, English, Chinese? So she found the language consistently that says spam sock and she figured that this is kind of, must be this new language in coming. And uh, it's completely, I mean, it's very funny when you read these covers. They change the name of actors, the, the name of the films. Some are really hilarious. But uh, for her, she now started associating this with, with the whole pro social process and consequence of migration and, and uh, translations and people having to learn new languages and integrate. And uh, she also found it very close to how her mother speaks because her mother lived in Germany, now she's in the United States, she is Japanese, lived in China. So she mixes these four languages and it's very similar to what she actually found printed on those DVD covers. So in a way she did this mapping of, of, of the space of People's Square based on the languages, the language, this new language on the DVD covers, which is very consistent. It's, it's really interesting. Um, there was another artist, Tiong Ang, who is um, ethnic Chinese, but was um, born in Indonesia, then immigrated to uh, the Netherlands. And he's always being perceived, people expect of him to, to make somehow Chinese art, just because he looks Chinese. And so he has always struggled with this, and it was interesting for him also to reflect back, to be there in this space, and see how does this affect him and his own history. And um, he actually uh, made a film and an installation with a friend of him, of his from Africa. So it was, his project was Buy African Goods. And there are no African goods in China. I mean, the Chinese are in Africa. So he was working with this kind of reverse stereotypes. And uh, it was a bit shocking because people were looking at this wondering, uh, uh, Africans selling stuff in China? You know, it, it's, he was kind of walking the streets. And so it, it was interesting. Um, and then I will just briefly talk about the Berlin Biennale and document, and then I'll give you the podium. <laughs> So the Berlin Biennale also started after the reunification. So it also was based on, okay, we need to, uh, to do something here um, and to see what experiments and what art and what ideas we can put forth through organizing a, a Biennale. And uh, this now, the, the one that it's happening right now, it's the eighth edition. Um, it is the, the main, Curatorial idea is to explore the intersections between individual, individuals' lives and larger historical narratives. 
um, and he's very much concerned with, with representations, with objects, what objects hold, what images mean, and um, not surprisingly, he chose the Ethnographic Museum as the biggest venue. So I definitely recommend it if you have time to see it. Um, and also it's a very, in a way, um, safe biennial because um, if you compare it to the previous one, the seventh Berlin Biennale, it was really, uh, I don't know if any of you know anything about it, but um, it was titled Forget Fear, and it was practically a platform for social activism, politi political activism, and pushing um, the boundaries of, of the institution, of what, how the institution of the Biennial works, how the institutions of artwork, what are the responsibilities of the artists, of the curators, of all the cultural agents involved in organizing such exhibitions, and urging them to contribute to um, to current political and social issues. So this was very interesting, and um, interestingly enough though, most of the art community um, refused to even go and see the exhibit. So it was kind of put in a different category, and it also it was the very first biennial that was uh, had entrance free of charge. Typically you have to pay between 10 and 16 euros, um, and this was open to the public. Anybody can go at any time, which also made it a, a little bit more democratic and sharing. <laughs> um, and I would like to end with Documenta, because Moody will actually speak about Documenta. Uh, the, the, sh the show was organized in 1955 by um, an artist, Arnold Boda. He was uh, at the time in Kassel. And in Kassel had a horticultural show, a very big horticultural show. And this was kind of a side thing. Uh, let's kind of, there are gonna be a lot of visitors, let's, let's do an art exhibit. And um, they were actually able to, to get a lot of, um, of donations. I mean, people from all over the world send them art for, to, be, to be exhibited. And it was a huge success and that's how it, it started. Um, so, but also what has to be said, uh, said about Documenta is since it has a much longer period to get organized, it has a much bigger uh, budget, and um, it has a huge space also and availabilities of venues. They are able to, to present a very well-researched and very thorough kind of survey of, of current contemporary art practices. Um, so it's, it's uh, very well respected and very well known. Also, uh, the fact is that Caso as a town um, is not known for pretty much anything else than Documenta. So in a way, Documenta kind of is the, what you would think of Caso, you know, unlike Berlin, even though now you also know the Berlin Biennale, but it, it has a huge impact on the city, on the city economy as well. And um, Moody will talk more about specifics of Documenta. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, the paper I'm going to present is called The Curatorial Color Curtain, Who Curates Postcolonial Contemporary African Art. I would like to start my presentation with a quote from a Nigerian-born curator, Ukwi Enrezo, who declared in an interview with the New York Times Magazine that the aim of a curator is not to, not to be a taste maker, but to produce knowledge. Ukwi Enrezo was the lead curator of Documenta 11 in Castle Journey, but this quotation I am underlining by this quotation, I'm underlining the existence of curators and art historians of contemporary art from Africa, whose absence I do not refer to in this presentation, but rather I'm suggesting the existence of an, a hierarchy of cultural memory and cultural relevance in the production of exhibitions like Documenta as a form of archive that nakedly gestures to heritage. I'm questioning the nature of filters of selection, inclusion, exclusion, definition and ultimately taste creation that support or is derived from international art platforms like Documenta. The last Documenta was two years ago and Documenta takes 
comes every five years. And it's a, a gathering to see and chart new pathways for contemporary art in Castle and the world. Um, it's considered the biggest um, um, and most critical in terms of curatorial perspective of arts in the sequence of biennials, triennials, and international art fairs and exhibitions. According to a quote from Goethe Institute's website, Documenta is the only major exhibition of contemporary art that always promise, promises an analysis of the present day. Documenta, Documenta 13, the most recent Documenta, created by Karolin Christoph Bakayev, which is important to note because she's the second only um, curator that has you know, um, created Documenta, was controversial for its non-thematic concept focus with not much painting. The exhibition's anti-capitalist theme, according to Christoph Bakayev, was driven by a holistic and non-negocentric vision that is skeptical of the persisting belief in economic growth and was a stage to present questions that shape our notion of life in the present. The program of Documenta 13 departed from the part of Documenta 12 and was very similar to Documenta 10 and 11, which both had political themes central to their curatorial worldview. For a curator like Caroline, who used, who apparently had nothing to prove. She used Documenta 13 as an opportunity to address certain imbalances she felt existed in international contemporary art, which over, with over a third of the participating artists being female, the highest percentage of women ever shown in Documenta. So here you see an exhibition being used to play international politics, gender issues, race. In an interview, um, Caroline theorized on how strawberries can become political actors and distinguish the lack of fundamental differences between human, humans and dogs. To, to her, it was important to recognize, and I quote, the role of art, the role art can play in society and how art and thinking can react to knowledge, capitalism, and to the financial world as, and its injustices. And end of quote. Which brings me to the main thrust of this paper, injustices, or using an euphemism, imbalances. Reviewing the list of over 200 names, it becomes obvious that in terms of definition, Africa is being represented by the Maghreb and the South of Africa. It is surprising that the famously viewed ethnographic West Africa has little or no presence, or had little or no presence in Documenta 13 in terms of artistic rep representation. This is noteworthy because Caroline had declared, and I quote, the riddle of art is that we don't know what it is until it no longer is what it was, end of quote. This begs the question, why is it that the work of Anglophone, Francophone, Lusophone, postcolonial art artists hardly get shown at big international contemporary art fiestas? Is it possible that there exists no critically worthy sculptures, paintings, installations, performances, photography, and films in such genres, genres like aesthetics, art, politics, cinema, literature, science, and philosophy in West Africa? Or is it not strange that in documenta that, in a documenta that argues a case for gender and animal rights, no, not to mention inanimate objects, that a region of the world that boasts of an ancient civilization like the Mali and Be Benin Empire of the world has no representation? Is this truly an honest, appraisal by an exhibition that always promises an analysis of the present day and attempts to collapse all conventional assumptions of contemporary art. One would argue that the premise of Western art comes from a philosophical um, 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 position. So one wonders whether this is um, not an affirmation of the Scottish philosophical view forwarded by David Hume that wrote, and I quote, it is natural for us to seek a standard of taste, a way by which the various sentiments of men may be reconciled, at least a decision afforded, confirming one sentiment and condemning another." End of quote. These questions are pertinent, especially as Caroline de claims that the borders between art, what is art and what is not art, are becoming less and less important. Obviously, um, um, she um, follows the sociological thinking of Pierre Bourdieu, um, that disagreed with Kant um, 
and who argued that taste could be disinterested and could have no agenda. Obviously, art has an agenda. And, and so it begs the real question, what is the criterion of selection for documenta? Interestingly, the idea behind documenta has a unique history. Documenta was founded in the spirit of healing the wounds of the Second World War, as um, she mentioned, by an artist called Arnold. And it began in 1955 to introduce West Germany to the world's cultural conversation. The goal of the first documenta was to exhibit art that had been dubbed degenerate in the Nazi era. Sh surely, even on the count of degenerate, ar degenerate art, Af Africa should have some form of representation. Um, Castle clearly reveals the sustained existence of the complexity of race and identity issues and the politics of hierarchies of culture in the arts. Um, as Oliver Machard would put it, the politics of political difference. This prevalence of an alter modern perspective and the dominance of a white male Christian Western European cultural preference hints directly to the racial European legacy of propagating modernist logic in the lingering colonial matrix and it sustains cultural suppression of black expression. The colonial construct still shapes contemporary ideas and notions of how Africa is positioned and how it positions itself and harks back to the era of necrophilia and words like primitive, tribal, and uncivilized art, um, which not only happens in Africa, but also, as I spoke yesterday, in New Zealand and other places. Um, this polemic is not new. African art historians from this region have forever cried out loud about Western complicity in the process of marginalization. Um, Sylvester Obeche, professor of um, art history, a Nigerian professor of art history, um, um, teaching in California, always talked about the cult of the superstar creators, stating the hype and star cult quality of most contemporary creators factor into, into a reorganization of cultural production as a process of brokerage and management. Curators fit into the new economy as cultural brokers who, def who mediate the value of artwork in economic and critical discourse. The difference between the political and politics in Western and African world viewpoints has inevitably led to the exploitation, discrimination, oppression, and manipulation of one cultural group by the other. Western curators, critics, and art historians more often than not today, determine what is in the center and what is in the periphery. This dichotomy of center versus periphery, according to Obeche, even continues in academia, where he claims that in art history, the opinion of most minor Western scholars is greater, has a greater weight than that of the most advanced African scholar, which shows a similar bias in the value of knowledge work. This situation poses a cl clear dilemma, as culture has always been about policy. Any form of validation desired or required from a former master or colonizer immediately undermines the cultural, intellectual, and political potency of any creative artistic tradition or endeavor. Culture has always been a means for holistic empowerment. W.E. Du Bois, in the, crit in, the crit in, in the criteria of Negro artists, in the Criteria of Negro Artists con Conference in 1926, declared that all art is propaganda and ever, and ever must be. Du Bois was far sighted when back then he understood the relevance of cultural production and he asserted that art is too potent a political medium to be left up to artists. He clearly saw the emergence of cultural gatekeepers, now called curators. Du Bois espoused that art could bridge persons nationally and internationally, a concept which was strongly echoed at the Bandu Conference of 1955. Those that don't know about this was, this was a conference for the non-aligned countries that thought about using art as a way for cultural, uh, you know, cultural identification and, and politics. Unfortunately, the politics of relevance, power, and status has split curators, art historians, artists, and academics of African descent into a Hegelian dialectic divide between continent and diasporic definitions of Africa that serves no useful purpose other than to complicate the challenges of contemporary African art. What is critical is to reclaim African culture, especially as the best of African culture production has been collected in Western museums like Dalem, through pillaging and with no regrets. Culture has always been a potent option, an entry point for black advancement. It is important to commend um, people like Simon Njami and Ukwe Nweza here, for if not for their cultural efforts, 
that put Africa on the map, the possibility of the framing of this debate on the direction of cont African contemporary art will not even exist. But this again seems to be the problem. There are relatively very few African curators who obviously are not excluded from the center periphery dichotomy. It is very obvious that the gaze by which African curators are looked upon in some quarters is often through a colored African lens, and this as well causes a struggle with the politics of race and color. This ugly game of pointing fingers ultimately points to the critical catalyst for the control of the discourse and, and economics of the field of cultural production, money. At the core of the debate is the question of who funds who and who is willing to fund African contemporary art. Where are the spaces interested in showing African contemporary art outside of Africa? Why is it easier to fund the contemporary African art space on the African continent than it is to fund one in the West? Um, for instance, there's a lot of funding that goes to a, a space maybe in Africa, but to put it to, to fund a space in the West that deals with African contemporary art that engages diaspora and immigrants and, and transborder identities. Nobody wants to fund that. Um, we are the new arenas where cultural authorities are negotiated. Ogbechi ret ret retains that the visual field of Western reception demands that contemporary African art conforms to established Western paradigms of art making. Rejection, rejection of this paradigm means most curators don't get the funding to do their work from funding institutions, practically all of which are based in Europe and the US. And this participates in a relocation of African cultural patrimony to Western ownership by enhancing Western authority in defining the value of African cultural production. One very interesting fact is that Documenta is funded largely by governments, public foundations, and ticket sales which reveals the political and global dimension of the importance and interest in cultural production. Cultural refinement has become a stimulant for mass tourism, and tourism has changed the way art spaces operate with tourism, and with tourism comes migration that brings a new diverse, diverse, diversity perspective and perspective. Art indeed has some gone global, and the number of Western art spaces has risen to match the demand in the increased number of regional and foreign visitors that are attracted to these spaces. Art spaces like museums must meet the expected content accessibility of their audience, i.e., they must reinforce stereotypes that are made about African contemporary art. So in Dalem, you would see all the sort of animist art. Nothing would suggest that there's any progress in that conversation. Or risk lo and if they don't do this, they risk losing a growing share of the, the, this market. With all these evident facts, it would be difficult to deny the capitalist aspirations of globalization. Economics is the most consequential feature of glo globalization, which determines politics, and politics in turn affects economics. And both of these influence the cultural magnitude of globalization. With globalization, with globalization art has become a com commodity to be consumed. And there is no other world culture that has been commodified as in the case of African art. African cultural products are consumed, judged, and appraised in terms of their Africanness. So the mask must be very African, you know? And ironically, the reverse is the case for the cultural African curator who has to toe the line of globalization and Western dominated homoge homogenization. So the Western, while the art has to be very African and primitive, the African curator has to be very Western in his approach or he gets no funding. Whether he wants to present an African, you know, Globalization, as we all know, is not neutral. Globalization functions automatically to reinforce the center, which in this case is the West, and the periphery, which is usually Africa. The logic that rapidly, uh, um, the trajectory of globalization destroys culture and breeds intolerance, hatred, suspicion, and, and fundamental and growing inequality of cultural production and distribution. The danger is that the present dialogue between world cultures and heritage has begun to sound more like a monologue. The question is to do Western cultural the question is do Western cultural institutions see the need the question is do Western cultural institutions see the need and importance to develop a model for operating with a globalized society that differs from the present corporate model. 
because you would hear, oh, this um, is a gallery that is not commercialized, meaning that it doesn't do a certain type of approach or it's you know, in independent. But that's also the case with um, big things like biennials, um, you know, documenta. Can Western art in initiatives rely, relying on their initial core principles of education, communication, preservation, and the promotion of free exchange of art and creative ideas, along with the current focus on building and sustaining community through culture, offer a new vision of globalization? You know, that's why you know, I um, thanked um, the organizers for even allowing us to have a chance to have this conversation or broaden the conversation, because it's very important. You know, um, I once tried to present this paper and I was shut down because the funders wouldn't like this sort of talk. You know, um, a way forward would be for Western governments and public institutions in countries with diverse racial identities to see the benefit of encouraging and supporting cultural activists and promoters of cultural spaces within these communities to develop a dialogue with more plural cultural voices that speak of their own contemporary cultures as it relates to the world. This could even be done to an extent by the redistribution of financing, which comes with an exhibition, is, which comes when an exhibition is co-hosted in other regions like Documenta 13 and Document 11 before it. Culture in its most explicit definition is not located to a particular region, but to the entire world, as confirmed by the global outrage whenever cultural patrimony is threatened. When um, we had problems in um, Timbuktu, for instance, and the, um, there was a breaking of the old um, manuscripts, the whole world said, oh, this is rubbish, or, or in Afghanistan when the Buddhist um, um, symbols were destroyed. So it, it tells you that you know, culture is global. You know? Maybe by my initial question of who creates post-colonial African art, um, the answer might be to include Africa in world conversations and in world platforms to understand, as we said, to pollinate the ideas that they come from and um, you know, extend the conversations of cultures or cultural practices that might not be marketable to the West but contribute to global art and cultural production. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wow. Um, I so this next part of the session um, would be a bit more. Um, but if you guys had questions for each other, I I have questions. <laughs> but um, but I I think it's nice if maybe there's a dialogue between your two presentations first um, to kind of establish some similar themes. And I'm sure there's people in the audience as well who have questions. So I'm just going to sit here a bit in the front and then um, in a little bit maybe introduce some other questions. Does that sound okay? This works. Okay. Oops, I mean, no, is that a bad idea? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, why don't you have the microphone? <laughs> Should I start? Yes. <laughs> OK. Um, well, actually, Moody and I met the other day, and we were um, kind of I was closer. Sorry. <laughs> um, we, we, were, we just were getting to know each other and what, what our topics of interest and research are. And we had this very heated discussion about one of the documentas, um, Documenta 12, which was the previous one. Um, it had, I, I personally interviewed three of the African artists that were uh, exhibiting their work there. And I was just sharing with Moody that I was very impressed by their work and um, what I thought about it. And he had a completely different perspective on it. So I'm just gonna uh, tell you what this one, well, the three of them. Okay, so one of the artists was uh, Professor David Aradeo. He's actually an, an architect from Nigeria. And he, uh, he traces the, um, the influences that are still visible today between the west coast of Africa, specifically Nigeria and Benin, and maybe and Brazil. I, and, Bra and, and Brazil. I don't know if any other countries in Africa, but um, 
and specifically there was a group of, of slaves that were in Brazil and they were um, always causing trouble, so they sent them back. Uh, and there were 500 people, they were Muslim, they were sent back to Nigeria and uh, they started be building mosques in the styles of the basilicas in Brazil. And when they were in Brazil, they were also putting a lot of elements in the buildings there that uh, they brought from their own heritage and, and methods of building. So he was, uh, Professor Odern was tracing these um, lines of connections and what you, it's still visible now. Um, and so his work was exhibited there and we had a very interesting conversation and I thought it was a, a first a very important um, way, a very important um, idea, uh, a new idea to present someone that was not an artist but an architect. Now it's more prevalent but at the time it wasn't. Um, the last document I had a scientist of, what is it, a physical, yes. a physics, yeah, a physics, right? Yeah, I'm just going to get to the next artist because of what this uh, David Ardell said about it and then we'll, I mean, unless you already want to say something about David Ardell. Okay, um, what she said is very precise. Um, there was a, a lot of riots in Brazil at the time, so they put all the, you know, the people that caused all the misbetemonas into a, um, a ship and shipped them to back to the West African coast and they dropped them on each port. So you have a trace from like Sierra Leone to Ghana, but the ma majority of them were dropped in Nigeria. On the West African coast, you can see um, some form of um, architectural dialectic or vernacular, as it were, that suggests this Latin influence in, in how they build. So they lent their craft, but it shows the power of identity and culture, but they, they still expressed it in their religion, which is, it's very hard to see an African society that does not embrace um, spirituality and religion, and it translates to almost anything they do. So, and because a lot of religion now in Africa has become very hybrid, so you have it taking or you know, um, and things from different places. Um, they started building their mosques in the tradition, in the in the progressive tradition of what they learned in Brazil as in, in the you know in the plan of the church. And I th I thought that was a good. Um, Thing that um, Professor Aridion had, you know, um, shown to the world, where um, cultures become hybrids and they are interpreted in different ways, and people see them as different things. So while this is a basilica somewhere else, it's a mosque somewhere else, and vice versa. Um, I think she wanted to ask another question, and I think the question she was going to talk about was basically about a certain um, body of work of um, certain types of photography and how. This was meant to establish the artist eventually in Nigeria. And I said to her at the time when we spoke that it's difficult to understand and appreciate that viewpoint because um, a lot of um, photography in the last decade that has come to the West has been influenced by wire services, Reuters, AFP, um, pictures from you know um, development work, UNICEF. And usually they frame an Africa with an aesthetic that is consumed by the West. And if you don't sort of toe that line, you don't get paid. So it's, it's a business. The, um, the world desires to see a, a, a low-level Africa, an Africa with starving children, an Africa that has um, bad um, um, social infrastructure, an Africa that d does not seem to have any other narrative than this downtrodden narrative. And it's problematic because in photography, you have people like Martin Parr that show, you know, sections of England that is buoyant, that is, um, you know, moving forward in its own direction. And I don't think that that is the only story you hear in Africa. Maybe, maybe we should uh, introduce what the, the work was. Yeah. Uh, so this, this work was by... So Correct. Correct. Yes. Yes. And then I said, oh, and uh, do you know George Osodi, who is uh, an AP photographer? He basically, he provides press photographs for the West. And he was chosen 
uh, a body of his work that was of the, the Niger it's Delta. a Niger Delta, um, the problems with the oil in the area and how it affected people, uh, the locals. Uh, a series of 200 photographs were presented at Documenta. And uh, what I wanted to say earlier was that David Aradown actually said about George Osori that by him being presented, chosen and presented in Documenta and seen in the West not only as a being, uh, uh, you know, providing images for the Western press, but also as an artist to actually look at the aesthetics of his work and, and his personal connection to what he does and how it affects him. Uh, he thought that he also has a, a critical stance and, and once he comes back, he goes back to Nigeria, having been in, at Documenta, having had this exposure and approval of the West, he'll have a voice and he potentially could have a different position there. And this is where we, we had a very heated discussion. Okay. Um, I was reluctant to answer a question because George Ushis is a friend of mine and I'm very um, conversant with the work. What I tried to tell her was the nuance in the presentation of this sort of photography and how it's very important to understand the industry behind these sort of images. It is true that a lot of um, heinous things happened in the Niger Delta, and it is true that a lot of it also was constructed in terms of imagery presented to the West. There was a very famous um, story about a Western or a CNN correspondent that apparently constructed a setting where there was a kidnapping. And this caused a lot of problem, and I think began the end of the production of these sort of images, because they said, oh, it was constructed, etc., etc. But what I was pointing out to her was that it begs the question of the gaze. What gaze do you shoot a photograph with? So how do you make a photograph? And, the, and photography, is, it, it's, it's important to know that in photography, there's no objective gaze. Because you shoot one thing and you, you're, you're leaving something out. So it depends on the gaze and the angle you want to shoot. Now, if you take pictures for AFP, the, the photo editor in AFP has to toe the line of cultural, the mass consumption of an image. So at the time, um, it was documentary 11, there was a 12, 12, 12 sorry, yeah. 12. Um, also, this works at, at 11 under Ukwe. But at 12, um, the whole world heard about these kidnappings in um, the Niger Delta, about the hanging of Ken Sarawiwa. Um, there was a lot of backing from Body Shop, from Anita Roddick. Um, it was pretty much the story in the headlines. And the, the, you had to present an image that fit the narrative. And no one was going to put the other stories that were coming out from the Niger Delta. So all I said to her was that I, I know of another photographer called George Esiri that maybe was a pioneer in the Niger Delta, and his gaze was never e exactly commercial in the sense that he, he really is an Ijo man and he comes from the area. So whenever he shoots the photographs, he makes pictures that speak about his identity as a member of that region and speaks as his identity also as a man documenting this process. And he, the images tell a different story because he, um, the world might not know his images, but they are wonderful to see. I wish someone would show that. And at the time, there were two people shooting this body of work. There was a guy called Ed Cash, Cashy, the American guy. And the gaze he came into from the New York Times was completely different from the gaze of Osudi. Both documenting reality and the truth as they saw it. But then whose truth is it? It's the same as I was saying. If the curators there chose also this work because it fitted a story that the West wanted to see. It doesn't speak, that, it doesn't say that the work wasn't good quality or wasn't fantastic photography, but it told a certain line. And it might be an honest line, but the gaze is still there. It's, it's, it's not as um, you know, objective as maybe it could be. Because the world, the world might not want to see what multinationals were doing there or the manipulation that world politics was affecting um, the Niger Delta. And that is where I told her that there's this, there is such a thing as um, the aesthetics of the West. 
and the, the, the business of cultural production that caters to the West. Yeah. yeah. So we have about half an hour left, so maybe we can actually pass the microphone. Yeah. Just so you guys know, yeah. um, if it's better to use the microphone, because otherwise Sorry. people in the live Sorry, feed can't I'm hear. No, that's too impatient. Too well, impatient. Maybe you can share that yeah, sure. you um, yeah, Lydia, uh, thanks. It, it's been really interesting. I, a few things about the Biennale. It connects with what we're talking now. And I'm wondering if you identified in your research, which is clearly very thorough, you gave a good account of, you know, the years and how it was established and all that. Um, and you talked about the thematics. Um, just a, as an aside before I get into this, the Biennale of Sydney is on right now. I think it finishes next, next week. Maybe it finished, you know, maybe now. Uh, this weekend, um, and it had a political thing too, where the people who are funded were found to be the people who build, um, a, they're a very well-known company, Transfield, and he is the head of a very large family of philanthropists, but they were involved in supplying some things for the refugee um, accommodation on the, the island where Australia ships refugees too, and uh, so the, the artists protested against this, and in fact, he withdrew, and they withdrew the funding, and the system had to come up, with, and this is millions and millions and millions. So the artists in that instance, politically, had an effect. So that's the latest thing, and also it had a title, which was, I think, you are what you desire. So it was this thematic thing, like Juliana Enberg. Anyway, that's just the, the Biennale, the, the one that's on now. But my, my interest is in the years of, uh, say, documenta, of when this was taking the 11th and the 12th. Because it seems to me that there's an aesthetic, not just an aesthetic of the West, there's an aesthetic that happens within art. For example, um, a few years ago, if you didn't make a a abject images, you know, images of abjectness, not beauty, abjectness, yeah? You wouldn't get shown practically anywhere, yeah? Because there was this kind of ma a re really big resurgence of, of the sort of the dark side, yeah? And so if it was an image of a child, couldn't be a, a nice child, had to be a devil child, yeah? If it was an image of a, I don't know, plant, anything, you know, I'm trying to come up with uh, examples. Do you know what I'm saying? And so I'm, I'm interested about that kind of aesthetic flavor that plays itself out, either in 11 and 12 documenta, perhaps, that, that also um, um, confuses this matter, because uh, I hear what you're saying, um, uh, Moody, um, and, and whether you see that playing out or, or on a broader way, the, the coming and going of this sort of a, the aesthetic almost taste, style, you know? Yeah, I mean, actually, thank you so much for the comments and the question. Can you hear me? OK. Uh, there, there's a, it's interesting that you mentioned, I'll first start with the, the Sydney Biennale and the whole situation there, because something very similar happened in St. Petersburg with Manifesta, which is the European Biennial, and it, it travels. Uh, it's in a different location every time. And of course, artists there were protesting against what's happening in Russia and Ukraine. And, um, and what happened in Sydney actually was that some of the artists then retracted and said, well, we actually were sort of coerced into, s into saying this and then uh, went back. And, uh, but it went into uh, a discussion in the Senate in, in Australia. And, they just said, well, what do the artists want? That's not their function, and we can just withdraw funding, and that's it. You know? They didn't. They didn't. So, but it was kind of, you know, that it, it actually did go somewhere, and, uh, and it started discussion. The same happened in, um, in St. Petersburg. Um, but I think what the Russian government decided was that they'll, they'll just have the right to withdraw any artwork that they don't see fit. So, uh, but in terms of aesthetics and if there is a trend, um, I think really it, it um, because biennials are so much responding to a situation, to a time, they're very specific to what's going on right now in our society that is bothering us or we like and we want to do something about it. So, 
I would, I would think that it's more connected to what troubles are going on in the world. <laughs> and, and so th this was, yeah. No, 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 finish. So I think the last few years have been really intense in many parts of the world, yeah. and of course that's reflected in the imagery, in the aesthetics, in the in the commentary, in the reflections of of artists. You know, they uh, there was an artist. Um, well, there is an artist from Mexico, Teresa Margoyes. Uh, she has been in a few Biennales now, and. Um, uh, she usually does huge installations, but I think her last work, which is a little bit different than what she usually does, was so strong, and it was, um, I don't know if you saw it at the last Berlin Biennale, it was an entire wall covered with 365 covers of a daily magazine that's being uh, published every day at two o'clock or one, I don't know, in Juarez, Mexico. And every single cover had a, a big image of a dead body due to, um, to, nar to uh, drug crimes. And there was a smaller picture of some kind of a sex something, some pornography. So every, it, it was just shocking to see this. And this is a magazine that comes out, a publication. Every day, all the children can see it when they come home from school. It's on every stand. And this is, you realize, this is their reality. It, it doesn't, it, it's shocking to me, but for them it's something normal, you know? So it's kind of, um, it was very striking to see this. So yes, it was uncomfortable to look at, and, um, and you're right, but her previous work at the Venice Biennale was what else can we talk about? And I think this is very uh, kind of telling in, in about this trend. I hope that answers the, yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah, um, to contribute to what she says, I, I would say, I would look at it from a different angle. I think it comes straight from the 60s, from Deschamps, and the definition of what contemporary postmodern art is. And we have to recognize that um, contemporary art, or the whole construct of documenta, Bianelli's and everything, and the uber curators that, yeah. that preside over these events, is also commodified. And there has to be some form of um, a filter that separates one creator from the other. And usually they use intellectual arguments to define how, why I should be chosen over the other. And usually it's under, underlined by some understanding of philosophy, artistic history, um, all kinds of measures are brought to bear. In terms of, let's say photography, they say a photograph stops being um, a snapshot or, 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 or a pretty picture when you can see clear intervention in the photograph. So, and anything that does not have intervention that can provoke an emotion is not art. It is just a photograph. So the, it, there must be a clear intervention in the photograph for it to be qualify as contemporary art or art. this is the theoretical definition of all, all this. Now, it is harder to sort of evoke emotion through a gaze than through very simple principles of using violence or blood, that things that shock, shock and gore can be easily used to evoke emotion and that automatically classifies you as contemporary art because you are bringing, the, um, many people would say that any art that cannot evoke any inf um, 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 emotion is a craft. So if, 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 for instance, I can't get moved in any certain way, then it's no more art as we see it, which is problematic. But then you can understand how this has progressed or degenerated because I mentioned Kant and I mentioned Berdeau and um, all these philosophical declarations about what art is and what art is not. And if you say you can do art for art's sake and you can say things like um, um, anything could be art, it's really now a question of through the back door, we are getting people that now are the people that are creating what is taste. And that speaks directly to class systems. It speaks directly to capitalism. It speaks directly to things that are really against the whole notion of contemporary art. Because basically, um, even people like Grace and Perry speak a lot about these ideas that taste is defined by your social status. So what a lower class person would say is tasteful, it would be different from a higher class. So it depends. And there's, not, there's no such thing as good taste, but then, Bordeaux that pushed this idea of there's no good taste or there's no such thing as good taste, 
is limited because he didn't understand art or wasn't an artist in a certain way. And there are things that we almost agree are good things. I mean, if you look at the Sistine Ch Chapel, everybody can see the genius there. You, you would all agree that this is genius and this is good art. So I think it's simplistic to say there's nothing like good taste or anything, but really when you ask, answer your question, it is maybe intellectual laziness and an easy way out to say we look for things that shock and awe people and say, oh, this is so crazy and then this is good and then we put it in. And usually um, human suffering can shock you. All forms of bizarreness, it, it, you see this in fashion as well. They would say, oh, um, I don't like this um, collection in fashion because it has no anarchy. And if there's no anarchy, then the collection is not good. So you see it in um, McQueen, for instance. The later collections by um, 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 Alexander McQueen were very, very strange and bizarre things he put up. And that is exactly the same way that people create art. The more bizarre and, you know, and strange than it is, once they, so some people would say, once I can't explain it, then it's good art. <laughs> you know, but then that turns everything on its head and it now begs the questions of who determines, bas basically like what I was saying, if we extend my presentation and saying who um, creates African art, who determines what should be good or bad, you know? And it, yes, it's also based on the climate and what is present and everything, but as much as there's an explosion happen, happening now somewhere, there's also a marriage happening or a naming ceremony or many things that we are happy about. So is it right to say that it's only a, a bomb blast or an assassination is a reflection of the present? Is the story, I'm not saying, you know, you're saying that. So I'm saying that w even the creatures, it's as, um, um, I, I don't know, I think you said, you know, the, the, f the act, the fact that these fiestas are also performances in, in, their, in, in, in a sense, and the creators are performing, you, you understand? And that is it, so you are performing to a script, and the stage is a script. So then you would say, okay, I want something that is not pleasant, and it, it, it can't be anything that can touch a, another part of my, um, my spiritual being or my consciousness, as it were. It must be something that will shock me, not something that will calm me down, you know? And then the next year, there'll be another philosophical thinking, and, uh, yeah? Sorry? Yes, and then everybody says, okay, this is nice now. It's just like in a few years ago, or even the last documentary, paintings were not cool. A, a painting is not art, so it must be, it must be video art, um, photography, or performance. And this is what we hear in Africa. If it's, if it's a painting, then it's not art. So you have to do performance, you have to do video art, and that this is what the West was, this is what we hear. So if you are into photography, you are into video art, and you are into performance, then you have a chance to be shown abroad. And so painting isn't good. And then you come here, and then you go to August Strasser, and you see all these galleries with paintings, or you go to these really, and you're thinking, okay, what is it that I'm missing? Is this not painting, and is painting still not art? You know, I don't know whether I've con answered any part of your question, but this is how I understand <laughs> it. You know, hold on. Um, well, I can definitely see your perspective, but um, when, when, it, when we talk about biennial aesthetics, um, there's also something that I call shared context that they create, uh, whereas works that could be autonomous on, on their own, then they start sort of communicating, relating to one another once they're in the same space. And I think curators are very much aware of this, and they, they do try to have some balance, but at the same time, it's, it's, there's a, an element of, of risk and unpredictability because they most of the time commission new works, and of course, they don't know what the artist will do. So th that's, that's kind of another discussion about what is the involvement of a curator in the artistic uh, production is it, is it on the, uh, in developing the idea? Is it just supporting the production? And so a lot of curators are very much aware of this and they don't want to have this much involvement. At the same time, there's um, unexpected results. And, uh, but you can clearly see like in this um, eight Biennale, works are really beautiful. You know, they're very, they're, they're very nice and clean and organized as opposed to the previous Biennale. So it does have a lot to do with the curator as well and what their uh, framework is. Even if they say we are not setting out framework, they are either by the name of the show or by their idea. Yeah. I just wanted to um, talk about the Dalim because I just did a one month residency there 
um, just before the Biennale. And, you know, I'm not a named famous artist that the curators have earmarked. And, you know, I was brought in by another organizer, two other organizations to work with the collections, which I'll talk about later. But it was interesting because a lot of the requests that I were putting forward, I mean, I have never heard no so many times in my life. And a lot of it was under this thing of, uh, because, because we've got the Biennale coming up. So I was really, at one stage, I had to really draw a line with the, um, the Humboldt Lab, because these were the people that I was, in terms, directly dealing with. And in terms of just this, this particular world that these biennales create, in terms of the value, what we, you talked before about the value of artwork inside the ethnological museum space, because actually, and I'm going to talk about a lot this later, because, you know, I am an artist that works in this space. You know, it's hugely problematic. It's a highly negotiated space. But at the same time, I've, you know, I have a good, you know, I have a good little tussle with them. Um, but it was interesting because actually reflecting on a group I was with, the Pacific Sisters, we were involved with the Sydney Biennale God, years ago. And again, we, we were treated like these underdogs. You know, there was times where we were asking for particular production values so that we would not look like amateurs. And this was my problem with Darlin too. At one stage I said, I did not come here to be average. And that when I went to the um, Biennale, I saw a lot of them had done a lot of, the, you know, I'd asked for lighting to be changed. You think I'd ask them to pull out their teeth. But when you've got this big authorized sort of um, thing behind them, they they were fine with them, but but not with not with this particular artist. So in in a way, I really did feel like that I was looking that I was being treated like the ethno artist that was going to. They got a very big surprise when 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 I finished with them because actually their own ignorance to my art practice was very prevalent too. Same in Sydney, in, in terms of there was one Chinese artist, now we found out that they spent $6,000 on the brackets alone to hang these works, and she had six works. And they were squabbling with us over three lights and some decent sound because we were kind of just like the performing artists, so we were kind of like, and performance wasn't in that year, so. Mm -hmm. so but it is interesting, the, these power structures and this value that is attached, and actually the, these biennales have created a hyper world that actually, if, if you're not sort of part of it, th then your work is actually devalued a lot. And I was intrigued that the Biennale wanted to come into the museum space. And uh, I would have liked to have seen a lot more rigorous um, intellectual sort of some, something behind a lot of the things. I don't know, that's where, the, that's where I actually don't mind the ethnological museum as a space because they actually do care about the histories and about some of these stories. I mean, it's highly contentious and negotiated again, but it's still very different to the white cube where, where context is relevant and you get just get given a frame there. But yeah, but I just thought I would, I'd just like to sort of put, put that in in terms of an artist who does work inside that space. I wanted to add to something she said. Though she said, um, I disagree in part with what she said that um, the curators um, really give you leeway. I don't think that's the truth. I think there's a real clear agenda here. And as you mentioned before, they work with their artists. They know the people they like. The risk they take are with the people that are the fringes. And those people, they, 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 they censor them by budgets, or send, send them by access, or even by where they put their work. Yep. And then these are people that are nominally said, oh, OK, we, we brought this person from here. Of course, the venue would not be the main venue. It would be a fringe venue. But then on paper, it would be said that I brought a person from Nigeria. He was shown here. Yeah. He did that. So it balances things out. But your known artists that you work with, the big names, the ones in the lights, you know what they're going to produce. It's, it, it, you can't say the curators don't know. They know. And that's why they would sit down and buy brackets for 6,000. They know. 
I mean, nobody's going to, you can't draw up a big budget and the person would ask you, why do you need $6,000 for, uh, you know, uh, embraces? They know. So I disagree that it is not as so, um, unconscious. It is very conscious. And the, 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 the truth that they now deny that they are people that define taste is not true. Because they define taste, they define consumption, they, design, they define and exclude what they want, and they push their own agenda, as in, if I think there should be more women, I bring them in. If I think there should be more Africans, I bring them in. If I think there should be more multicultural gays, I bring them in. And though the team is there, you can bend the team to mean anything. There's a different way you can bend the team. So I don't think it's really clearly, I agree in parts, but I, don't, I disagree in parts too. As we discussed, every biennial is different, every team is different, so it's really difficult to generalize, but, um, but this is from my observation of just uh, researching in depth uh, seven or eight biennials. Um, in one, I was the, the last, the seventh Berlin Biennale, I was with, with them for an entire year. Um, so that's how I actually got to know a lot about all of these power relations and the power structure and uh, actually, Artur Zimzewski, the, um, the curator of the Seven Berlin Biennale, thought that the person with the more power, the most power, is the attorney of the Kunstwerke. <laughs> <laughs> so he he has the the he is on top. This is how his power ar hierarchy was. Um, but uh, to go back to Dalem, I agree with you that it's a very big institution. It's part of the all 19 state museums in Berlin. So they actually have a centralized uh, governing body, and then they have local. In Dalem, there are three museums. There's the Asian Museum, yeah, the, the yeah. So, um, so, but it's it's also difficult for them individually to make any decisions and to implement any changes without having the approval of somebody who is not even in their museum. And even as something simple as uh, videotaping the exhibit, uh, I have I have a workshop where my students are are interviewing artists, and it's in a collaboration with the museum and the Biennale, and the artists want to do this, and the official department, which is somewhere in Berlin, is not giving us a permit to go with a video camera in the museum, which is a public space. It's a, you know, everybody wants to give interviews and to, uh, yeah, to do it. And saying that there was video cameras, there was three Yes, we, there was we three finally video cameras at, th at the Biennale yes, on the we day that I was there. When they want to, they can make decisions very fast. When they want to, and you know, I made them want to a couple of times, but it was through a highly negotiated process. Yes, and just I for the fact the same thing. that that you know that I'm a very experienced person in terms of negotiating these spaces. So it, it's just. I suppose this reflection of of the power structures within themselves, you know, with of the Dalem, yeah, of the institution, yeah, of the institution uh, and to another institution like the Biennale too, because that's another institution. Yes, it has money behind it. It it has a it has a historical framework, and it you know, and a global one too. So, I mean, it did interest me that they were interested in working inside the. Ethnological museum, in terms of artists who don't usually do it, but if you get one who usually does it, the value of my work was definitely not put on the same bar as the these you know kind of real artists. But how how do you judge this? Well, I judged it from my treatment, so I'm coming from a very personal experience okay. on on this level, and and one is a practicing artist for over 20 years too, so you know it just didn't happen overnight in terms of experiencing some of the barriers, which is why I'm very good at negotiating these spaces, but in terms of really making sure that I got out of it what I want, because I will always work with the ethnological space, and maybe some of these artists might play with it, but then next year it'll be something else and something else and something else. Um, I actually just wanted to say something really quickly, um, ask uh, the, one of the questions that I had, um, which is connected actually to the potential partnerships and work that Innovate Heritage wants to do, um, is that uh, 
There is the new Humboldt Forum that's being constructed in the center of Berlin, which is basically a reconstruction of the former Prussian palace with the new interior, which is where the Dalla Museum and the Asian Art Museum and uh, also the library and the university and a lot of different collections are going to be there. But um, uh, me and Katerina had a meeting with them um, Professor Partzinger, who is one of the lead people in this project, and he was talking about really wanting to include like having artists and contemporary and all these different things, and I've been reading about this. So it's this thing where, I mean, Moody was also talking um, to us the other day about these ideas of um, how these kind of ethnological museums function, because it's really like, you know, uh, and what level are they being, are these spaces newly constructed so that they are being more I don't know if it's politically correct or they're being more conscious or something and including more people, but there's, I don't know how much repatriation stuff is actually being included. It's kind of like there's still a treasure chest in this like old, like this very intense colonial aspect to it. So for me, it's like this, you know, it's a really amazing opportunity, of course, to have, for, especially for dialogue. And I'm, I mean, I think there's work for healing. Uh, there's a lot of things. And I think Rosanna's work uh, with the reactivation that I saw, the Dalla Museum was really, I, I really like that, that kind of dialogue space that's beginning. But um, I'm just wondering about these kinds of ideas around arts in relationship to heritage spaces and these museums and stuff. I mean, sorry, this, I know this, <laughs> we have 10 minutes and we're trying to wrap up, but um, this is something I would be really interested to hear maybe from the both of you. And I don't know, uh, I think I'm gonna talk about it later. Rosanna will talk about it in her uh, talk later. So sorry, I know that's big, but it's, I think it's this idea of the Humboldt form and this idea of arts and these, these, when these, new spa these spaces are being newly constructed and I don't know how, I don't know, advice on how to well, I'll engage start, in that. Yeah. I'll start with the, the notion of repatriation and when, as it refers to heritage and culture. Um, you have to start by looking at what the colonial concept or construct did to um, identity, did to philosophy, and did to the culture of the people. So once you look at that, then you now see the real big problem of a post-colonial deconstruction of these views. So you, the process would be, you first acknowledge that there was a colonial, um, colonial invasion into your identity and your heritage. Then the next thing is to how do, how do you deconstruct this construction? How do you say, so you look for where they intervened in who you were, where they tampered with your identity, where they tampered with your culture. But then the real challenge comes in how do you decolonize your thinking and logic? How do you put value to something that has been devalued over centuries. Mm -hmm. How a person takes your Benin mask and says it's animist, it's a very primitive mask, you, you don't know what to do, you have never known how to forge metal, yeah, yeah, you know, like you have no culture, you have no philosophy, it's always said to us in West Africa. And then you now look, then all of a sudden, they want to give it back to you because it has value. But they've told you for over a century that it has no value, it's a memory of some, um, um, a marker of your backwardness, then you now have to now value something that you have forced yourself to devalue for over a century. It is, becomes very problematic. Mm -hmm. Where, how, what are you repatriating back? How do you give people back what you've uh, forced them mm -hmm. to disagree that, to agree that it has no value? So this is really where the problem comes. Um, as we spoke, spoke about the other day, that some of these museums are actually uh, um, installations confirming superiority, really. It's a reminder that we were above you, really, that we can still keep your skulls and we can keep your daggers and all these symbols of authority that you have, and we can now talk about it and talk about how relevant it is. But in truth, they work in a negative way by affirming a, superior, a, a hierarchy of superiority, because if we could hold this part of who you are and as a proof that <laughs> we could devalue it to you and to us, and then we now tell you, okay, it's valuable, and you now make a sense of it, it's, it's, it, it speaks directly to hierarchies of cultural dominance mm -hmm. and um, the problems that surround such spaces. You understand? They are valuable in many ways, but they are also you know, uh, spaces that show how culture, heritage, is um, maybe the last bastion of racism, gender issues, and all these other things. Thank you. It's, um, of course, I, I mean, you have the best perspective because Africa is, uh, you know, items from Africa are f 
are in the museums. So um, I think what I can say is that, I mean, I absolutely agree with you, and uh, this is a huge problem in anthropology of what to do with this, um, how, to, how to handle the, the past, and how to incorporate it in the present, because um, it is there, it happened, it's, it's part of history. So in its, on its own, it's, it's, a, it's a document, it's a, it's a mm, part of, a par, a par, a part of uh, history, yeah, and, and it's an evidence, exactly. So um, I think what the, the Humboldt lab is trying to do with the museum is also addressing these issues and say, what, what can we do with this? Can we attach stories? They actually did something where they recorded about 250 um, or 25 hours, no, 25 hours of stories about items and they were looping it in the museum just so that you actually, it's not just this fetish item that it's there that had completely different meaning in, from, in the place where it was taken from and now you're, uh, you know, using it as a representative of something a lot bigger. Uh, so they were actually attaching stories of how it was taken and all that. And the, the Dalim Museum um, has about 500,000 items and only 4% are on display. So that's another thing. Who chooses what to be displayed? Who chooses these 4%? A lot of the curators have been working there for 40 years, you know? And so that's also a, a, a big issue now that they will be moving in 2019 to the very center of Berlin. They need to modernize the way they present, the way they address I the issues. The Prussian castle, it's just like nuts. I know, and that, that's yeah. also a big, a big yeah. issue. It's like, I mean, it's, it's, uh, this is a kind of erasing of uh, physical memory, architectural memory from the city uh, that, that is also very political because it was the, you know the story about uh, Palace de Republic, it was the East German government building that was destroyed in order to make yeah. this. So um, it doesn't exist anymore. It's not in the collective architectural space. So um, maybe maybe this can be the last yeah, somebody, comment. I want to add just a little bit. No, no, no. I'm just going to say this is the last comment, and then we're going to end, so we'll have a 15-minute pause, and then the next. But question. adding to what she said, um, there are also notions of what value is. and whether value can be linked to a space. In Africa, certain things are, the value is in the space, is the fact that the object is situated in a certain space. There are certain um, functional spiritual items that once you move them from the space, the value has disappeared. So you find these things in Dalem. You can't give them back to a, 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 an Ifa priest. It has been devalued immediately by touching it and moving it from that space. You, you understand? And it, um, it's like, um, how would I put it? Um, I saw her um, with HSB. Now, if you're a Muslim and there's a Quran and a person hasn't performed abolition and carries the Quran, it has devalued the whole thing. So there's that sort, there's the notion of location specific valuation. So you can't return certain things that you've devalued by just moving them. It's not just a, it's a case of, oh, you painted on it or you took out all the precious stones. No, you moved it and you devalued it. You just took a step with it, it's been devalued. You know, saying so, um, some of these things have been devalued in many ways other than just taking them and putting them somewhere else. Yeah. Well, you know. Okay, on that note, I think, I'm sorry, I have to uh, finish wrapping up. So, I'm, I think this is a really great conversation. Of course, we can continue. So, hopefully, Thank we for being here continue to have yeah. more conversations like this. Thank you so much for our speakers. Thank you. So. Um, I'm just going to say we have, uh, I think, a 15-minute break. And